Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You no doubt know that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And this particular series, we've already looked at a couple lessons, is a fairly new one on the book of Revelation. This is lesson number three in that series entitled Jesus' Message, Messages to the Seven Churches. It's the lesson for January 19 of 2019. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we bow before you now asking us that you will guide us in understanding these messages, which have so many implications for our understanding of this book, and so many questions that still ra are raised even after we've studied it carefully. Help us to learn as much as we can as our <laughs> prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if you are a student of Revelation, you already know that Revelation 2 and 3 include messages to seven different churches. Last week we touched on the church of Ephesus, the first of those seven churches, and this week we'll talk about the remaining six churches in that, um, those two books, those two chapters, I'm sorry. We need to mention a couple of things, first of all. Often we sort of get the impression that all the churches that were there in, the, in, in that part of the world were, were, were received messages. That's not true. There were a lot of other churches in Asia Minor, Cappadocia, Galatia, that did not receive messages in these two chapters. Why didn't they receive message, messages? Anybody have an idea? can only have seven. Well, you can only have a certain number. You got, otherwise, the book would go on and on, I guess. That's uh, one possibility. No, you need seven. You need seven. You okay. need seven okay. because seven is important in Revelation. Okay, yeah, we'll agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> need also, seven, okay. Yeah. Also, also, there, uh, as you go through each of the churches, there are things that are said that are relevant to that actual place. There's mm -hmm. symbolism that yep. kind of piles up there. And, of course, as Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that God has the ability to predict the future. And it looks clearly like he picked out churches that match certain time periods in the future history of the Christian church. And that's important because we're going to see other prophecies through the book of Revelation that scatter down through time. And, and so this is giving us a hint about what might be coming up ahead. So we're going to suggest that those seven churches were chosen for very specific reasons. Well, um, we have no way of knowing whether John recognized any prophetic application of the messages to the churches in his day. He uh, no doubt knew those churches or knew people from those churches. But there's a lot of other things we want to talk about regarding these seven churches. and. Uh, Let's just look at some patterns, for example. Carrie, I think you have a suggestion there. Yes, and this comes from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide number 40. The messages to the seven churches have a common structure similar in form to ancient letters. Number one, Jesus addresses each church by name. Number two, he then introduces himself to each church using characteristics drawn from Revelation chapter 1. Number three, he offers an analysis of the strengths and or weaknesses of each church. Number four, Jesus provides counsel suitable to his analysis of each church. Number five, an appeal is made to the church to listen to the Spirit. Number six, each message concludes with a promise or promises to those in each church who overcome. In messages four through seven, beginning with Thyatira, the fifth and sixth components are in reverse order. So already you can see, well, why would he do that? Why does he all of a sudden change the order? You know, you could raise a lot of questions about these messages, but we'll leave you to query that in your own mind. It's clear, I hope, to those who've read these chapters previously and maybe on multiple occasions, that Jesus had a very clear understanding and appreciation 
for those churches, what was happening in them at, in those days, and also to the future time periods that we're going to talk about down until the second coming of Jesus. So although we, we've already reviewed the, the message to the church at, at uh, Ephesus, so w what church comes next? Smyrna. 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 Okay. Dennis, can you tell us something about Smyrna? I can read this, yes. Revelation 2, verses 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, This is the message from the one who is the first and the last, who died and lived again. I know your troubles. I know that you are poor, but really you are rich. I know the evil things said against you by those who claim to be Jews, but are not. They are a group that belongs to Satan. Don't be afraid of anything you are about to suffer. Listen, the devil will put you to the test by having some of you, you thrown into prison, and your troubles will last 10 days. Be faithful to me, even if it means death, and I will give you uh, life as your prize of victory. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Those who win the victory will not be hurt by the second death. And that's the Good News uh, Bible from American Bible Society. Smyrna was the second city in our list. It's by far the largest and most important city of the seven that's still surviving in the, in the uh, country of Turkey today. It's the third largest city in Turkey. And I might add, it's a, how do I say this nicely? It's a a rebel city, a university city, and it's one of the ones that gives the government in Turkey the biggest problems hmm. because the students are tending, want, to, want to think for themselves in those universities. Having said that... Is, uh, there, any, is there any extra biblical information about that church that you can think of? About the church in Smyrna? In, yeah. city. Oh, oh, oh yes, oh yes, absolutely. One of the things that talks about that's very important from ancient times about the city of Smyrna is the story of Polycarp. Polycarp was probably, if not the first elder of Smyrna, he was one of the very, maybe the second elder. He was the head elder, or at least the chief spokesman for the city of, for the church in Smyrna for 40 years. And of course, by the time he came to the end of those 40 years, uh, there was a lot of persecution of Christians going on. And one day, it was actually on a Sabbath, he was caught. They, they caught him. And the Roman soldiers came. And so Polycarp said, when they caught him, he's outside of in the rural area, not too far from the main city. And he says, oh, come on in. We'll give you something to eat. So he invited this, those soldiers into someone's house there. It turns out to be a Christian, but I don't, probably didn't mention that to the soldiers. He invited them into that house. He said, could you please feed these people and so forth? And he knew that he was waiting to be, that he was, they're getting ready to take him out. When they got him out and, and, and took him to the place of, of torture and persecution, um, everybody was yelling for him to be thrown to the lions. Well, for whatever reason, I have no idea what the reasons for this are, but the Roman government had a rule that you can only throw people to the lions up to a certain time of the day, and it was already past that time. <laughs> furthermore, furthermore, the lions were already full because they had already consumed one or two people, I don't know however many, but they were full. They weren't, they weren't hungry at that point in time. So, believe it or not, the Jews in the city who, who were rabid anti-Christians said, burn him. And so, this is documented clearly. The only time it's documented in ancient history, the Jews on the Sabbath helped to collect firewood to burn Polycarp. Mm -hmm. So, did you want some history on? Well, I was going? wondering too about the, the 10 days. Does the 10 days fit in? Yes, anything? absolutely. Of course, we would say that, that that time period went from about 100 AD to about 313 AD. And those last 10 years, they, there was an emperor, who a Diocletian by the name, who when he arrived on the throne, he said, so help me, I'm gonna eliminate these Christians. 
they are they are for they are, they are forming an even greater threat to the Roman government. We got to get rid of them. And there was a serious serious persecution of Christians for ten ten years. And then bang, he was his his governorship was I mean his emperor. emperor what do you call an emperorship? Whatever. His <laughs> his time his reign <laughs> ended, and and along came. Uh, um, Constantine. 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 Constantine is the one I'm trying to think of. Constantine, which of course he flipped to the Christian side. So, yeah. So that's what the, that's the story about the ten days. Hmm. So whereas the church at Ephesus represents that prophetic period from 100 to, I mean, from the time of Christ to the end about 100 A.D. Now we've talked mentioned Smyrna represents a time period from 100 A.D. to about 313 A.D. We now have another church church by the name of Pergamum. And uh, this is found in Revelation 2, 12 to 17. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, this is the message from the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you live, there where Satan has his throne. You are true to me, and you did not abandon your faith in me, even during the time when Antipas, my faithful witness, was killed there where Satan lives. But there are a few things I have against you. There are some among you who follow the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak how to lead the people of Israel into sin by persuading them to eat food that had been offered to idols and to practice sexual immorality. In the same way, you have people among you who follow the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans. Now turn from your sins. If you don't, I will come to you soon and fight against those people with the sword that comes out of my mouth. If you have ears then, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To those who win the victory I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give each of them a white stone on which is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. That's from the Good News Bible. Very good. So we come next to the city of Pergamum. Pergamum was famous for, for several reasons. First of all, it was the capital of Asia Minor in those days. And that happened because uh, the last king of Pergamum, for a while it was a kingdom of its own, the last king decided that since he didn't have an appropriate heir to take over the throne, mm -hmm. he, he sat down and wrote out an agreement with the Roman government, because Rome was rising in power those days, he said, if you will not give me any trouble until I die, you can take over my kingdom when I die. And that's what happened. In, in, in exchange, he said, I want you to make Pergamum the capital of Asia Minor, and they did. So it, even though it was by far smaller than Ephesus, say, for example, and some other cities in the area, um, it became, it became the, the capital of, of the Asia, Asia Minor, that province. Uh, more other, another thing I can tell you about Pergamum, it is located in a very steep, high mountain, very steep, high mountain. It's very difficult to get up there. In fact, most people who visit there take a tramway to get up there just to get. And a couple more things. One, at the top of the mountain, it's almost full of what used to be temples. There's a, a, some area, one, on one side is for the where the, where the palace and where the king lived and so forth. But there were a lot of, of in, in very big temples to various gods. It was one of the very first churches, not churches, where the very first, first cities to actually uh, build a temple to, to an to a, to a, um, emperor. At the bottom of that hill, just outside, so just outside of that thing, there was a famous healing temple from which we get that symbol of the two snakes round, wrapped, wrapped around the pole that's supposed to be <laughs> talk about healing, a place in, where there was all sorts of interesting stuff going on and tunnels that you could walk through and so forth, and water that was supposed to heal you, and by sacrificing certain animals and so forth, you were supposed to be healed. And so it was a great healing center at the bottom of the, of the mountain. But there was a lot of, go ahead. How did they get the water on top of the hill? They had a very sophisticated system for getting water up. Uh, there was a big lake at the bottom, and they had a way of getting up. I, I never could figure out. They tried to explain it to us, but I never figured out exactly how it did, how it worked. But they they got water up there. Smart people. Yeah. 
Yeah. Before you go, this is a little sideline question. This is the Lord himself speaking and he says, um, food offered to idols. And yeah. St. Paul had no problems with it. Well, a little different situation there. Uh, what Paul is talking about, you know, first of all, in Acts 15, they were told no food. Remember the four things that they required of, of, of sure. the Gentiles when they joined the Christian church? No food offered to the idols. That was one of the main ones. Okay. Paul said, when you're going to the marketplace in Corinth, you have no way of knowing what's been offered to the idols and what way hasn't been, unless you buy only vegetables. If you buy only vegetables, the, the, the gods didn't like vegetables, I guess. <laughs> so the uh, vegetables didn't get offered to the gods. But other stuff, you couldn't be sure. And of course, Paul was saying it didn't really matter uh, whether something was offered to these metal or gold or wooden, wooden images. It doesn't affect the food in any way. But it's nevertheless true that offer, eating food offered to those idols in most places represented basically worshiping those idols. And that's what we're talking about here. And I tell you, if you go to, if you go to uh, Pergamum, there was just almost standing room only between the temples on the top of that mountain. And so if you were up there and lived in other places, you, it would have been very difficult. And I can tell you that down over the side, there was a very steep amphitheater. On one side of the amphitheater was a small temple to um, Dionysius, the, the, the god of wine and so forth like that. So you can imagine what that implied. What do we know about the Nicolaitans? Well, there's been some speculation that the Nicolaitans were people who followed the teachings of Nicholas, one of the seven deacons. And he was the one who said, well, we don't have to stick so close to all that stuff. Uh, it's all right if you eat food offered to idols. It's all right if you um, get involved in sexual immorality and so forth like that. Uh, there's no hard, fast linkage, but at least that's one possibility that that's what that was about. Okay, Thyatira. Revelation 2:18 to 29 to the angel of the church in Thyatira write this is the message from the Son of God whose eyes blaze like fire whose feet shine like polished brass I know what you do I know your love your faithfulness your service and your patience I know that you are doing more now than you did at first but this is what I have against you you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a messenger of God. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into practicing sexual immorality and eating food that has been offered to idols. I have given her time to repent of her sins, but she does not want to turn from her immorality. And so I will throw her on to a bed where she and those who committed adultery with her will suffer terribly. I will do this now unless they repent of the wicked things they did with her. I will also kill her followers, and then all the churches will know that I am the one who knows everyone's thoughts and wishes. I will repay each of you according to what you have done. But the rest of you in Thyatira have not followed this evil teaching. You have not learned that the others what the others call the deep secrets of Satan. I say to you that I will not put any other burden on you, but until I come you must hold firmly <coughs> to what you have. To those who win the victory, who continue to the end to do what I want, I will give the same authority that I received from my Father. I will give them authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod and to break them to pieces like clay plot, pots. I will also give them the morning star. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That's quite a word picture. Yeah. Jezebel on the bed. Yeah, well, then remember the story of Jezebel? We, we sometimes forget the, the details, or we, maybe we don't even know about the details of Jezebel. Jezebel was a, mission, a foreign missionary. She was sent by her father, 
who was the high priest of Baal, living in the city of Sidon, she was sent over to convince all the Israelites that they should worship Baal and they should join the people of Tyre and Sidon and become part of that country. We know, we all we know about her is the fact that she married Ahab and that she, you know, was that evil woman. But she, she thought of herself as a foreign missionary. <laughs> That's what she was trying to do, go over there and win all those people to worship Baal. We never thought of that She before. probably did a pretty good job of it. it looks, she did a way <laughs> too good job of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, but it's also interesting that uh, shortly before the Lord going to the cross, mm -hmm. he walked the 200 miles and went to Tyre and Sidon. Yes. And there was a lady yep. who worshipped the Lord. Who was a Canaanite, by yeah, the way. Yeah, was a Canaanite. Ancient Canaanite. Outcast. Yeah. Well, Thyatira is, Thyatira is not a big city, mount, you know, big city that was famous for its size or famous because it was on top of a mountain or anything else like that. But it was a city famous for its industries and for its guilds, what they would call guilds. And you, you had to belong to a guild in order to you sell your goods and so forth like that. So if, if you rebelled against your guild, you were in trouble, real trouble. They would, people would just choke you out so, or, or keep you out of business. You couldn't, and these guilds often did various kinds of celebrations, including a lot of immorality and so forth like that. One other thing Thyatira was famous for, you remember the story of Lydia, the first Christian in, purple. yeah, she was a seller of purple. And that purple was actually derived from the roots of a thing called the matter plant. And it was a, a deep red, it wasn't really a purple, we wouldn't really call it a purple, it was more of a deep red. But she sold garments, uh, uh, dyed this deep red color over in, in Greece, well in Macedonia really, uh, and that was her business. She was a wealthy businesswoman, but her, she got the color from Thyatira. Hmm. How about the message, the faithful in Thyatira? Okay. where the angel says, I will give them authority over the nations to rule with an iron rod to break them to pieces like clay pots, and then I will also give them the morning star. What did that yeah. mean to the church in Thyatira? Okay, well, idea? to what it, what it meant to the church of Thyatira, we have almost no information about the church itself in Thyatira. Basically, what, as far as I know, except what's in here in the New Testament. In terms of what it means in the prophetic period, this was the time when the morning star of the Reformation came up toward the end of the time. And who was the morning star of the Reformation? Luther. Erasmus. Mm -hmm. Wycliffe. 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 Wycliffe, exactly. Yeah. Wycliffe was the morning star of the Reformation. So he the was there in that time. So Thyatira is, now it, we're going to see that Thyatira gets special emphasis in this series of six here. And there's a reason for that. It's the only one of the seven churches that ends up really somewhat better spiritually than it started out. And what caused that? Why, wh in what way did Thyatira get better? We should mention that was, Thyatira was by far the longest time period from AD 538 to 1565. What happened during those, those, those years? The Middle Ages. Dark, dark ages. The Dark Ages. The Dark Ages and what happened around 1525? Protestant Reformation. The Protestant Reformation, exactly. So the Thyatira period is a time when Western Europe, Western civilization basically was dominated by the Roman Catholic Church and we know all the implications of that. Um, it's interesting, one thing we haven't mentioned yet, but each one of these churches, when he talks about the church, there's something mentioned at the, in addressing the angel of that church that comes from Revelation 1. Remember, we just here in Thyatira, we saw, what was it? Um, eyes blaze like fire, feet shone like polished brass. Well, in Revelation 1, it's, it calls it, uh, no, in, in the Old Testament, it calls it bronze. They also, it's also linked to certain passages in the Old Testament. So again, a lot of, if we had a lot of time, we would discuss all those issues. Um, during this time, tradition took the place of the Bible. Well, we know how the Catholic Church has worked, and basically what happened is that when Constantine declared that the, the Christian Church should be the church, the, the, the main church of the, of the um, Roman Empire, um, what happened, all the people who came in, 
basically because that's what was required, uh, they brought with them all their customs and traditions and so forth from their pagan worship. Uh, one of the obvious and interesting things that they brought with them was the celebration of Easter. Uh, now we think of Easter as a time when Jesus died and we celebrate the death, etc. But Easter was originally a celebration of Ishtar, a woman who um, worked for, the ruled for a while as the queen of one of the ancient nations, and she got pregnant um, Ill illegitimately. And so when, when they found out that she was pregnant, they said, well, how did you possibly get pregnant? She said, oh, well, the gods came down and from the sky and they got me pregnant. Well, how do I know that? Well, because they got pregnant on the most auspicious day in the heavens. It was the first Sunday after the first full moon. So she had the blessing of the sun god, she had the blessing of the moon god. And it, after the first day of spring, which is the blessing of the fertility gods who supposedly rise and begin to produce on the first day of spring. So how do we derive the, how do we arrive at the day of Easter each year? The first Sunday after the first full moon, after the first day of spring. We're still following the ancient custom, ancient pagan way of determining that date, even though we supposedly celebrate the death of Jesus. And uh, it was blessed by the, by the Pope himself. Oh, yes. A specific day. Well, Absolutely. split the church <coughs> between the East and the West because the East wanted to follow the, uh, uh, the Passover, you know, the Jewish yeah. festivals yeah. Uh, to keep so, it in line. Well, in other ways in which the, the mm -hmm. Thyatira period is important and which I would say might also have something to do with the Morning Star effect was that during that time, that was the time of the Walden Seas and some other groups that were doing, s a few other groups did similar things. But, I mean, these people lived under very difficult circumstances. They spread the gospel under very difficult circumstances. They translated the Bible into local languages under very difficult circumstances. And yet they, they stood as shining witnesses. We will get to hear some amazing stories from the Walden Seas when we get to heaven. I can just tell you some of the things there's a story, a few stories recorded. One that really stands out in my mind is that one time the Roman army came up after them and they had them trapped at the top of, pretty much at the top of a mountain. A large number of them trapped at the top of a mountain. And the Roman army, it was, they couldn't get over the other side because it was even steep rocky mountains on the other side. There was no way for them to escape. And the Roman army was cap, camped in the, in, the, in the valley right below them. And that night, during the night, the entire group, including small children, marched down that mountain under the direction of God and right through the middle of the Roman camp without a single person waking up or knowing they were, they were, th that was happening, up the other side of the mountain. And, and when the Romans woke up the next morning, they were just disappearing over the mountain in the, in the other direction. They were gone. Stories like that, and there's a lot of stories, but that's just one. Went on the... Uh, great controversy tour with Dr. Damstead. Yeah. Told the story where we stood there, and then he took us to another place where straight cliff going down. The Roman soldiers would dangle the kids, little babies, yeah. parents, and says, "Get back to the mother church, or else." We'll drop and then out. they would kill the parents. Yes, throughout history. We're going to hear these stories again and again and again. You, if you get a chance to travel up there to the um, the valleys there where they where they were living and beautiful valleys, beautiful the valleys, Sabbath. they all kept the Sabbath. Did you go to the um, place where they? Ellen White spoke three times in the church. Yeah, we that was that's not what I was thinking about. But there's a there's a place there where there is a pile of rocks on the side of a a ridge there. And you wouldn't think there was anything there. It just looks like a big old pile of rocks. Uh, I mean, it's just, you know, it does not stick out particularly, but you can see the rocks out there and they're sort of down to the side like this. And they say, go here, the, see, the, see the underground church. And you follow these, these signs and you cannot find it. I, my wife was about to strangle me because I spent half an hour looking for this church. Finally, just about the time we had to go, I looked up underneath the rock and sure enough there was a sign and that you could ch over the rock and down in there, there was a place big enough for at least 200 people to hide in that pile of rocks. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. 
Well, so um, the one quick. Yeah. I I don't. I, I'm not fond of Christmas, and I'm not fond of Easter. Easter yeah. So, why do our churches? Well, we we celebrate not the dates, I hope, but the events. No, but should not not do it toward the year? You know, yeah. Christ who is born in our hearts. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm passionate about this, yeah. about my faith. Uh, we are all here, but yeah. aren't we setting a wrong example to... Well, well, I think Ellen White talked about Christmas specifically mm -hmm. as, you know, having... Well, Christmas, the, the 25th of December was the day when Ishtar's baby was born, sure. Tammuz. So, I mean, these are these are pagan things that came into the Christian church from pagan places. So, are, are we supposed to be scared of them just because of that? I mean, well, we weren't question, really scared of I eating would, it would eating be, meat off or to idols. So, the um, idea the ideal thing would be for us if there were some way to do it, find out the real day when Jesus was born and document it, and then celebrate that. We have any way, no way of knowing when he was born. It's for sure it wasn't in the middle of winter because this was a date when they, everybody was expected to travel to their, you know, their original cities and pay their taxes. There's no way they would do, try to do that in the middle of winter. So it was probably late May, May, June, somewhere about in that time of the year, but we don't know. There's a gentleman who uh, became a Seventh-day Adventist, grew up in, um, in Iraq. And uh, he's a lawyer, and uh, he talks about when uh, the Reformation came up, that the Catholics, Catholic Church was ready to go and destroy these nonsense people. But right at that time, the Turks rebelled. So they had to get their attention toward the Turks for how long, how many hundred well, years? Charles V, I think it was. Yes. And it gave the Protestant Protestants Reverend. to flourish. He says, so Protestants, you have to be thankful to your... Is the, the Muslims. Yeah. Yes. He also talks about in the 600s, that uh, another time when the Muslims came to rescue to the... Yeah. Let me just spell that out for you a little bit more. At the time, the Protestant Reformation was really just getting off the ground, and there were these big conflicts within Germany about whether, and par Charles was the supposedly the Holy, Holy Roman Emperor trying to, trying to suppress this Protestant, because he was, he was still not depending on the support from the Roman Catholic Church. And he was about to squelch the, the Protestant Reformation when the Muslims came charging in from the East, and he spent basically the rest of his life trying to keep back the Muslims, and because he was fighting the Muslims, he didn't have time to squash the Protestant Reformation. So we have a sort of backhand thank, thanks to give to the Muslims for that. Okay, well, we need to move on. Charles, <coughs> I think you're going to tell us about the Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, This is the message from the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know what you are doing. I know that you have the reputation of being alive, even though you are dead. So wake up and strengthen what you still have before it dies completely. For I find that what you have done is not yet perfect in the sight of, God, of my God. Remember then what you were taught and what you heard. Obey it and turn from your sins. If you do not wake up, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not even know the time when I will come. But a few of you there inside this have kept your clothes clean. You will walk with me, clothed in white, because you are worthy to do so. Those who win the victory will be clothed like this in, uh, in white, and I will not remove their names from the book of the living. In the presence of my Father and of the angels, I will declare openly that they belong to me. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit, has, Spirit says 
to the church's Good News Bible. So we believe that the Church of Sardis represents the Christian church history from about 1565 to 1740. What happened during that time? Well, the Protestant Reformation. The right? Protestant Reformation flowered out. It right. was really, it really blossomed. And then they began to establish creeds and everything was sort of set in cement. And the, 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 really the power and the excitement of the Protestant Reformation just sort of died away, unfortunately, very unfortunate. Um, but say a little bit, a little bit about ancient Sardis. Ancient Sardis still has a pretty good sized city there. Um, there's an interesting uh, place where there's a huge temple to pagan gods and so forth. And in the side court of that place, there's a Jewish synagogue. Mm. It's a big, and out right, right next to the Jewish synagogue, there's a huge uh, sports field. So there's the the, the temple is here, and then there's this big exercise. Of course, next to the temple is a, the, the baths with the hot water and the lukewarm water and the cold water and so forth, the regular Roman bath kind of thing. And then there's a huge sports field, and next to the sports field is the, is the Jewish synagogue. Sardis itself, like Pergamum, was built on a high, high plateau, uh, just a small spur that sticks up there, and it's way up there. In fact, there are no roads up there. There's no easy way to get there. If you want to, if you want to get there to where Sardis was really the headquarters of Sardis was, it's several hours hiking up a steep trail. You, 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 it's not easy to get there. I have pictures of it from far away through my telephoto lens, but uh, it's not easy to get there. And right at the bottom of that hill, there are temples to the pagan gods. So that's and a people still live there. Yeah, there's a it, there's a, still a city there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and some and some ancient walls besides the the, the beautiful building that that's, that's built there with that I talked about that has the baths and so forth in it the facade is still standing believe it or not it's beautiful I mean it looks like almost like a you know would think this is some maybe a modern building made in, made in one of the older styles but it's a massive impressive how, building how on earth they got the material up there oh no this temple is at the bottom it's not a even yeah, the things that they good question. There. Of course, the thing is that Sardis thought that because they were way up there on the top of the mountain, and the, the, the mountains both sides are almost, except one, just one side that's, that's a little bit not quite so steep, they thought they were perfectly safe. They had the gate closed. Twice they were, they were conquered. How, you know how they were conquered? Up the side somewhere. Somebody sneaked up there. Someone managed to crawl up through the very crawl up those steep si sl slopes, and, and while the Sardinians were sleeping inside, opened the gate and let the enemy in. That, a Alexander the Great's army did that, and then, and then um, Antiochus the Great, not Antiochus Epiphanes. Uh, did Jonathan do something like that once? Yeah, he did. <laughs> and Troy did basically something like that. Remember the story of Troy with the horse? Mm -hmm. same, well, same, nothing more, new. A little bit sort of the same kind of thing. So that happened to Sardis twice. And of course it's um, interesting that the warning was stay awake so you won't be caught unawares. Well, that's what happened to Sardis, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note that coins were very first, for the very first place, were minted in Sardis. Some of them, there's a half a dozen or so of those coins still left. They just took a, a lump of gold and whacked it with a really <laughs> big old, big old thing, and it, it's, it's sort of off center a little bit, but it's the impression of a lion and so forth. And you can, so they were the, they were that was the beginning of coins. Um, there wasn't anything before. Well, there was money, but it was just. A, a weighted a weighed amount of gold or a weighed amount of silver or something like that. It wasn't actual coin that was, you know, with some kind was of a it design. Pre -weighed? Huh? Was it pre-weighed? Oh, it was weighed, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah it was pre-weighed. And it was a amalgam between silver and gold uh, called an electrum. Hmm. So it was fairly soft. Okay, Jim B. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, Right, the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and to no one, excuse me, and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works, 
Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, of patient, yeah, patient endurance, I will keep you from the trial, excuse me, the hour of trial which is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell upon the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may seize your crown. He who conquers, I will make him a pillar of in the temple of my God. Never shall he sh go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, the story of the Church of Philadelphia covers a relatively short period of time. What in period of time, but a relatively short period of time from about 1740-ish to 1844. It was a time of great religious awakening in Europe and North America. What was the cause for that great religious awakening? Studying prophecy. Okay, why were they studying prophecy? Looking for the Lord to return. Yeah, but there was a reason why they were looking for the, the Lord. There was the the stars fell. The, the Lisbon earthquake the came earthquake, first, 1755, and then the stars. dark day in 1780, and then finally the stars falling in 1833. And the moon turned. And the moon, the, the same night that the yeah. that the sun was darkened and moon yeah. turned to blood, and people started saying, "Hey, I, I think it says something in the Bible about this kind of stuff." And so all of a sudden, people were reading their Bibles to see about these. And they said, oh, this is connected to the second coming of Jesus. And all of a sudden, there was a great religious awakening. Now, that has impacted us in a number of ways. Two things, really huge things that affect this Adventist church happened as a result of that great religious, well, more than that, but I mean, even in the early parts of that great religious awakening. One is that a group of people in England particularly said, if we're supposed to be spreading the gospel to the whole world, how are we going to spread the gospel to people in India and China and Africa? We don't, they don't have Bibles. We don't even know how to speak their languages, whatever. And so they started the British and Foreign Bible Society. And for the first time, they made a real effort to translate the Bible into, or at least portions of the Bible into other languages so the gospel could be spread to other parts of the world. And there's marvelous stories about some of the first missionaries went to China, some of the first missionaries who went to India. Even David Livingston is famous of his trek and his experiences in Africa and so forth. Something else that has impacted us that a lot of people don't know about, when the King James Bible was printed in 1611, it always, by, by law, included the Apocrypha. And it wasn't until about 1802 through 234, somewhere in there, that the British and Foreign Bible side said, we're not too sure about this Apocrypha stuff. Protestants aren't supporting it. We can't afford to spend the extra money it costs to print that Apocrypha in our Bibles. And they just arbitrarily made a decision that in preparing Bibles to send around the world, they would not include the Apocrypha. Otherwise, the Apocrypha would still be in our Bibles. That's about what time? 18, somewhere between 1800 and 1804, somewhere in there, they made that decision. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I've never heard that. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, I have an apocrypha in my Bible. And you can still yeah. buy a lot of the major translations have, that are Catholic versions of, the, of those Bibles have the apocrypha still in it. And the Roman Catholic Church still recognizes it as being inspired. Somewhere back in there, Sir Isaac Newton got into working out some of these yep. dates, and he was Pretty close. Yes, right. He was pretty close. He was quite a student of Scripture. Yeah. yeah. Well, of course, the famous thing that really impacted Adventists was the story of William Miller yeah. and how he started studying the Bible around about 1819. And he, he said, I'm going to start out with Genesis 1. He was a soldier. He was a, he was a local politician, that kind of stuff, but he, he, and a farmer. 
You start out with the Bible and says, I'm not going to read on to the next verse until I'm sure I know what that first verse means. And he worked his way slowly, slowly, slowly through the Bible until he came to Daniel and he was the first one that sort of figured out that maybe those prophecies might extend all the way down to originally he thought 1843 and then later he, he decided no it should be 1844 uh, and thus led to that great religious awakening that that came to be known as the great disappointment but he wasn't the only one there were others in South America that were doing the same thing people in Europe were doing the same thing Yes, Charles. Yeah, there were kids in uh, Switzerland Sweden. or Sweden. Sweden. Well, right. the, the ones in Switzerland, <coughs> what happened in Switzerland is one of the Protestant reformers wasn't too much for being a preacher and teaching in church and so forth. So he became a teacher of young children. Hmm. And he would go, he would teach them about the stories in the Bible. The kids would go home and tell their parents, and pretty soon the parents, they wanted to come to school to, <laughs> to hear all the stories and learn more about the Bible. But in Sweden, the, um, the kids were, were preachers. You know, there, there was a law against anybody who was an adult preaching against the organized church, the official church of the government. But there was no law that said kids couldn't preach against the government. So there were, there were um, child preachers in, up in Sweden. These um, happenings, the Lisbon's earthquake, yeah. the moon turning red, the sun not Are giving light, the stars falling, all these have been well documented. Yes. But anyone else other than the Adventists picked up on this saying, hey, this is uh, uh, A prophetic. lot of people have picked up on it without giving any explanation. It, it's clearly documented. There's n it was in all yeah, the newspapers happened. and things like that. But the prophetic implication, no, no one else other than Seb the Adventists. Nobody except Seb the Adventists. Yeah. So now we come to the church at Laodicea. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. I'm reading from the Good News Bible. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, this is the message from the Amen, the faithful and true witness who is the origin of all that God has created. I know what you have done. I know that you are neither cold nor hot. How I wish you were either one or the other. But because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit, the text says, but it actually, the Greek word is vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich and well off. I have all I need, but you do not know how miserable and pitiful you are. You are poor, naked, and blind. I advise you then to buy gold from me, pure gold, in order to be rich. Buy also white clothing to dress yourself and cover over your shameful nakedness. Buy also some ointment to put on your eyes so that you may see. I rebuke and punish all whom I love. Be in earnest then and turn from your sins. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, and they will eat with me. And that's important. We, we mentioned that, I think, earlier, but um, important that eat with them and they with me. That's a signature kind of statement for the Apostle John. It occurs a number of times in the Gospel of John, and it occurs the only other places in the, in the book of Revelation. So this is one of the strong indications that this book was also written by John. To those who win the victory, I will give the right to sit beside me on my throne, just as I have been victorious and now sit by my Father on his throne. If you have ears, then listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So what do we know about Laodicea? Well, we believe that it represents the church from the time of 1844, from the time when, when Christ uh, changed the ministry, his ministry in heaven. He no longer did what we would, what used to be represented by the priest going into the holy par department of the old temple, uh, offering sacrifices and, and, and forgiving sins and that kind of stuff. He now enters into the most holy place in the tabernacle and begins a new kind of ministry which involves a time of judgment, what we would call the pre-advent judgment and so forth. But turning to Laodicea itself, it was a very wealthy city. It was a big banking city. When they had a s terrible earthquake about AD 60, the Roman government offered to help them out to rebuild. They said, we don't need your help. We have all the money we need. We'll rebuild our own city. And um, they continued to have other earthquakes after that. It was destroyed several other times further on down in history. It was one of three cities Located in a certain valley, the three cities were Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Hierapolis is on the northeastern 
side of that valley, I'm sorry, the northwestern side of that valley, and it's located in a spot where there are a lot of hot springs. Lovely place, even today, big, beautiful hot springs, that people, big hotels there and all that kind of stuff. It, we believe that there, there's pretty good evidence that uh, the disciple Philip is buried there, or was buried, who knows what's happened to his body now, but there's some strong indications of that. Colossi, in the southeastern part of that valley, is at the foot of a high mountain, several, two, three high mountains, that, and there's a cold river that runs down from their side and right beside the Colossian town. And so they had the cold water, the Hierapolis people had the hot water, and Laodicea was left to collect their water from the valley, from springs and so forth. They, by the way, are just now uncovering some of the pipes that carried that lukewarm water into the city of, of Laodicea. The major sin of the Laodiceans was not heresy or some kind of open sin. It was complacency and spiritual lethargy. Because the Laodiceans, Laodiceans considered themselves rich and increased with goods, they didn't need anything. God literally said he would bomb them out of his mouth. It's interesting that there are four words that are, are mentioned there in that particular com condemnation of of um, Laodicea that are also found in Revelation 16, 15, right in the middle of the plagues. Is there a reason why the, the warnings to Laodicea and church are also in the middle of the plagues? Well, we don't want to won't have time to talk about that right now. Jesus loved the Laodiceans. He gave them a marvelous promise that if they would buy the gold, white, not black garments, Laodicea was famous for its black wool that they wove into all kinds of different garments. But he said, no, you need white garments. And ISAB, they had a, they had a medical school there, and one of their fa they were famous for a kind of ISAB that was supposed to heal all sorts of eye diseases. So it's interesting that Jesus picks out the specific things that, that are characteristic of Laodicea. Carrie, I think you have something more to tell us. Yes. In concluding each message, Jesus makes promises to those in the churches who accept his counsel. One might observe, however, that along with the evident spiritual decline in the churches, there is a proportionate increase in promises given. Ephesus, to whom Jesus gives the first message, receives only one promise. As each church follows the downward spiritual trend, each one receives more promises than the previous church. Finally, the church in Laodicea, while given only one promise, receives the greatest promise of all to share Jesus' throne. It comes from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Yeah. So how should we feel about God's end time church in which we are living? Dennis? We should remember that the church, enfeebled and defective though it be, is the only object on earth on which Christ bestows his supreme regard. He is constantly watching it with solicitude and is strengthening it by his Holy Spirit. E.G. White Manuscript, uh, <coughs> 1902, in Selected Messages 396.2. Yeah. There are several other places where that idea is basically the same pr presented. Well, there's an, uh, another interesting thing. We've sort of touched on this briefly. Uh, these messages are, are, are organized in what's called a chiastic form. That is, and, and there's a passage there that talks about that. Margaret, maybe you could read that to us. A letter to Smyrna, second letter, Share, shares many similarities with the letter to the Philadelphians, the sixth letter. Both are largely positive messages. The letters to Pergamum, the third letter, and Sardis, the fifth letter, are to the churches in steep decline. The message to Thyatira, the fourth, and the middle church is twice as long as the others and is different from all the others. See theme four. Yeah. This arrangement means that the first and last letters to Ephesus and to Laodicea are also parallel. This structure suggests that Laodicea, like Ephesus, suffers from a deficiency of love. This comes from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Lesson, Bible oh, Study Guide. 
Wow, could that be true of us? Is that a correct representation of God's faithful people at the end of time? Another interesting progression seen in these messages as follows. Jim? But this word picture leads into the most encouraging part of the messages to the seven churches. The first church gets one promise, the tree of life. The second church gets two, the crown of life and deliverance from the second death. The third church gets three, hidden manna, a white stone, and a new name. The fourth church gets four promises. The fifth church gets five. The sixth church gets six. Each church gets more promises than the church before. And the seventh church, Laodicea, gets the loftiest promise of all, to sit with Jesus on his throne. Wow, that's also from the Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide in page 41. So if we say that Thyatira was the center of this chiasm, the point, see, in ancient, especially Hebrew customs, it's very often for something to be organized like this where the major point is that thing right in the middle as opposed to we tend to think of things that well you build up and the big point is at the end. So what's special about the church at Thyatira? We've already talked about several of those things. They would talk about the Walden Seas and what they did and the fact that um, our friend the Morning Star of the Reformation, Wycliffe. It, it uh, was the longest period. It was also the longest period. Yeah. So despite these promises, there is another serious factor which must be commented on. The great Christian expansion mentioned that came under the Philadelphian period had a dark side. Many of the missionaries who went out from Europe and North America carried with them not only Christianity, but also a lot of Western civilization expansionism with economic and political aims. This led to the fact that today in many areas of the world, Christianity is under direct attack. The final events in this world's history will demonstrate that Christians will have a work very hard, to, will have to work very hard to spread the gospel under most difficult circumstances. Well, we've looked at these six churches. You can think about them in your own terms. You realize that there are some outstanding points about each of these churches that might help us to understand a little bit better the history of the Christian church down through the ages. So we hope that you found this interesting and rewarding as we have been studying it. Thank you for joining us. Kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is always to study your word and, word and to think about the implications of all these messages. Unfortunately, today we just barely had a chance to touch on some of the most important things in each of these churches' history. May we Study these things each time with your guidance, the Holy Spirit's guidance, so that we may understand them better is our prayer in Jesus' name.